Greetings and salutations again, everybody. We're going to go on to uh, the second Sunday of Lent, which we just had, and it's Wednesday, so it is uh, the Midwest, uh, the midweek uh, reminder. Okay. All right, the second um, Sunday of Lent, uh, the first reading is God calling Abraham to a new land, and then the second Sunday of Lent is always, always, always the transfiguration. When Peter, James, and John join Jesus on the top of Mount Tabor, and Jesus is transfigured, he shows who he really is, the Son of God. And Moses and Elijah appear, and they talk about his upcoming uh, passion and death. And in that, uh, the three apostles hear the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. But here's the point in Matthew's Gospel. They are afraid, Peter, James, and John, okay? And we're going to be talking about that theme, okay? All right, I caught you up here. You ready? Here we go. Um, one of my heroes, and he's on my left shoulder, see him right there, is Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II. I believe he was truly one of the greatest men that ever lived in the 20th century, like, up there, okay? And um, he was Pope when I was born. And um, I actually experienced a miracle with him and I wanna tell you about it. Back in 2002, I was a brand new seminarian for the Archdiocese of Dubuque. And in 2002, World Youth Day came to North America, to Toronto, Canada. And Toronto's pretty close when it comes to the Pope coming. So I joined a group of Dubuqueers and seminarians and priests and lay people, and we traveled in a bus and we went to Toronto, Canada, and we went to World Youth Day. It was awesome. About a million people all came, and it was a great festival of faith. Got to see the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, and um, yeah, it was a wonderful time. The end of every World Youth Day is the same. You process from one area of Toronto to a place that they designate for an all-night vigil. So we walked. The, my memory serves me about five miles in procession. We go to this abandoned airfield in Toronto, outside of Toronto, and we have an all-night vigil. They have a stage and all that. And uh, the Pope comes that night. He gives us an address, and then we pray before the Blessed Sacrament, and we have an all-night vigil of a million people having a camping, a camping party. It was pretty cool. But the next morning at 6 a.m., while we were sleeping, it torrentially downpoured upon the airfield and we were sopping wet and as the morning progressed and we were getting ready for the papal mass the closing papal mass we started to get nervous as we saw the sky started to turn green it looked really serious severe weather was coming in we started to get a little bit nervous but anyway right as the papal mass was beginning a 40 mile an hour, 40 mile an hour wind came through the clouds parted, the sun came out, the blue sky came, and the Pope came onto the stage and we had mass with him. And we're looking at each other like, hey, this is, this is pretty odd. I found out the rest of the story. That day, when Pope John Paul II was about to come out, the organizers of World Youth Day said, Holy Father, we need to send the crowd away. We don't want anyone to get struck by lightning. What if they get struck by lightning? It ruined our World Youth Days for the future. And the Holy Father says, we are going to have Mass for these people. So he bowed his head in prayer, and he blessed the sky. And the clouds parted. Okay? Bonafide miracle, in my opinion. But in his homily, Pope John Paul II hit one of his classic themes throughout his whole pontificate. And he said to us, young people in Toronto, do not be afraid to allow Christ into your hearts. He said that to people who are discerning the priesthood. He said it to people discerning marriage. He said it to people who are afraid of persecution in their faith. And he said, do not be afraid. And he said it in my English language, and he said it directly to me. I had one of those experiences where I felt that the Holy Father was, listening, was speaking to me personally. I bring that up because fear is one of the most common experiences that we have. 
We are fearful of the coronavirus. We are fearful of financial security in the future with the stock market. We are fearful of having good or bad leaders. We are fearful that we're going to get sick. We're fearful for the future of our children. Many times we are motivated by fear instead of trust. And when we're motivated by fear, Father Emmerich, uh, Father Emmerich Vogt, who was our parish mission last year, would say, fear is the chief activator of our faults. When we act from fear, the worst part of us comes out. And isn't it funny that in the Bible, you know how many times God says, do not be afraid in the Bible? 365 times, which means one for each day of the year. Do not be afraid. And when you look at the people of the Bible, they experienced fear, but they show what to do with that fear. Take a little sip of coffee. They show us what to do with that fear. And here's the conviction that they had. They, they trusted in the one who is guiding them instead of knowing the details of the future. Let me say that one more time. They were trusting in the one who was guiding them, the Lord, instead of wanting to know the details of the future. So I'm just going to go through several figures of the Bible and to illustrate that point. Abraham, he didn't know where the Holy Land was. He was perfectly content living in Iraq. And the Lord says, I will make you a great nation, but first go to the land I'm sending you to. Moses didn't know how to lead people out of Egypt, out of slavery. He had a stuttering problem. Yet the Lord said to Moses, I will be with you. Jeremiah was too young. He says, Lord, I'm too young to be a prophet. And what did the Lord say to Jeremiah? I will be with you to anoint your words. Think of John the Baptist, right? He was out in the desert doing his best. And God was with him. Think of Mary not knowing the future. She knew the one who was calling her to be the mother of God, but she didn't know how that was going to plan out, how that was going to pan out in her life, yet she trusted. Joseph, when he was told to go to Egypt, he had never been to Egypt, and yet he trusted knowing that God would see him through. Think of the apostles. They weren't preachers, they weren't theologians, they weren't teachers, yet God made them preachers and teachers of the gospel, right? There are times, brothers and sisters, when I wake up and I say, I don't know what it means to be a priest. I don't know how to be a pastor. I don't know how to lead people in the Catholic faith. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, I know the one who is leading us. It's not me. It's the Lord Jesus. And all I want is for every single person to know the one who is trustworthy. Because just think about it. Fear pops up many times when there's talk of parish closings, when there's talk of consolidation of schools, when there's precarious health, when there's the coronavirus, when there's uncertainty in the future, our fear comes up because we don't know what's going to happen. We want to know the details. We want to have the wheel, our hands on the, on, the, on the wheel. And yet God is saying, I have it. Trust me. I will take you to a better future than you can provide for yourself. And that's why I think over and over and over again, God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to give your life completely to me. Do not be afraid to allow me into the bedroom in your intimacy and openness to life. Do not be afraid to let my values, my gospel, influence the way you spend your money. Do not be afraid to give more of yourself to me because you will not lose yourself, you will find it. That's what Jesus is getting at. He who saves his life will lose it, but he who loses his life will find it. It's in losing our life, which is expressly, it's, a, it's expressed in giving up control, is where we find the grace of the Holy Spirit and the closeness of Jesus in our lives. So 
What are you afraid of? Tell Jesus. And let him guide you. Let go of the details. The details will be figured out, but they are not the most important part. That's what it means to trust God, is to believe in the one who leads. And as we have seen in the Bible, whenever he leads, it's always to something better. And may God bless you.